Did you suspect a drug problem? Do you think he could have saved him? God. Did he have to die for you to recognize that he loved you? <sighs> Next. Can you be as famous as your father was famous, as famous as your former husband Michael Jackson was famous, as famous as you've grown up to be, and be normal? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can only answer for myself. <laughs> I can tell you I'm not normal. And you um, have managed to be, you know, relatively very private, and that's why I'm, I'm thrilled that you're talking to me today. You've made a conscious decision to talk now. Why? Every time I've ever had an interview in the past, I tend to get very defensive because I was usually promoting something, mm -hmm. and it would cross, it would always cross into my personal life, and I tended to want to never discuss the two. Like, I don't want them to cross. Mm -hmm. I know that it's hard to have them not, but I wanted to sit and really have a conversation about uh, things that are, uh, you know, more on a personal level now out of the way before I do have an album coming out, which I will uh, sometime next year because... Mm -hmm. I get is, that. You know, I get that. You didn't want to be in the position of promoting an album and having people ask you about Michael Jackson. Exactly. The star-crossed love affair between Lisa Marie Presley and Michael Jackson started in 1993. What began as friendship bloomed very quickly into something more. And in 1994, Lisa Marie shocked the world when she married Michael Jackson. And just a year and a half later, their marriage was over. They had not spoken for nearly a decade when Michael was found dead on June 25th, 2009 at a rented home in Los Angeles. You've not spoken about Michael Jackson since his death, other than the blog that you did. Right, and I, and I really didn't speak well. When I see previous interviews, I'm barky, and I tend to want to skirt out of it, and I would find quick little exits mm -hmm. defensively mm -hmm. out of it. So yeah. yeah, it's interesting because the very first interview that we did together, when I asked you, was it a real relationship, you became a little barky and defensive because... Because I didn't understand my relationship with him. Well, you know, having, having gotten to know you um, since then, I understand your defensiveness uh, coming from your point of view, but coming from my point of view, the viewer's point of view, the, the world didn't know what to make of that. Right. And really still doesn't know what to make of that. And therefore your blog after his death where you said, I want to set the record straight, this relationship was not a sham. This was a real marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I think really struck a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And even when you said on my show, yes, this was a real marriage, there was a se sexual relationship and all of that. But the rest of the world, I think, thought it was a big staged um, publicity something. Right. I don't know. Do you understand I that now? Understand. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that because to some degree he was a master at manipulating a little bit uh, with the media. So mm -hmm. I understand that there was nobody really knew who who I was. So mm -hmm. they just For assumed sure. that I was going along with something that he would be doing. And Absolutely. A lot of that is what I wanted to clear up in an interview, in this interview, was to explain mm -hmm. He was brought up that way. You know, before even an answering questions about him or talking about him, it would need to be understood fully his life, which is completely different than anyone else's life that ever was, except for, you know, my father. Mm -hmm. He was conditioned to, to sort of get himself where he needed to go uh, for his career and with his talent. And he became very good at making and creating and, and manipulating and manipulating to some degree. Mm -hmm. It's true, but but see and I always confused that manipulation thinking that that manipulation was that meant that he didn't love me, mm -hmm. you know. But I understand it better now. The manipulation was because it was a survival tactic for him. Mm -hmm. So was is it after his death that you have gained such clarity about the relationship? Yes, and I don't know why. I really don't understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, this whole last year and a half has been spent 
trying to gain the clarity because at some point I pushed it away and I just had to move on with my life and and then that happened and it, and it, it was like a tidal wave where were you I was in England um, and I don't know why but it was the strangest day of my life I was crying all day mm -hmm. for what reason I don't know and I don't normally do that and I was you know trying to work and came home and I was literally cutting my food into my dinner crying and um, I wanted to go upstairs and go to bed and just watch something mindless on TV and stop crying. I looked at my husband, I was like, I don't know what is wrong with me, I just can't stop. And um, and then an hour later, the knock came and I, I heard. You heard? Who told you? Um, it was a friend of mine who just, and actually I got started getting texts, are you okay, are you okay? And I was like, what's happening? Um, actually John Travolta was one of the first texts I got, are you alright? Mm -hmm. I said, what's happening? Is this actually happening? It was still unclear, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and your reaction, your first reaction? Sh real honest to goodness shock, not even tears, just, you know, I was floored, honestly floored. June 25th, 2009. Apparently, Michael Jackson suffered cardiac arrest this afternoon. He was rushed to UCLA Medical Center. People around the world were glued to their televisions as events unfolded in Los Angeles. By late afternoon, it was clear. Michael Jackson, the legendary pop star known by millions of fans around the world, has died. A little over one year later, I've come to England to talk to Lisa Marie Presley about their relationship and his death. The next day after Michael's death, you posted a very emotional thoughts on your blog. What made you do that? Um, I, I think I was just rocking a baby to sleep and I was just in floods of tears and I thought, I don't know, I, I had a moment of clarity and I realized all this bitterness I thought I had and, you know, and, uh, indifference and it was no longer. It all just came. It, I don't even... It, it's been so crazy, Oprah, that I, I don't even know how to explain how all of it's happened, which is why mm -hmm. I waited over a year mm -hmm. to talk about it. Because so many... There were so many phases of this. So, so let me help you through it here. Yes, Let please. me read an excerpt of what you wrote the day after Michael died. You said, The person I failed to help is being transferred right now to the L.A. County Coroner's Office for his autopsy. All my indifference and detachment that I worked so hard to achieve over the years has just gone into the bowels of hell and right now I am gutted. Gutted. I thought that was an interesting choice of words. That means gutted, empty, dug out, really. Mm -hmm. So did you feel that you had failed to help him? Yes. Okay, so in May of 1994, when you were married to him, or during the time that you were married to him, did you suspect a drug problem? Honestly, uh, I didn't really suspect and catch on until, um, until uh, just before I filed for divorce. You know, there was just an occasion, an incident where he had collapsed, mm -hmm. and he was in the hospital. This is during the HBO? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This was an appearance he was supposed to make. Yeah, and an appearance for HBO, yeah. In December 1995, Michael Jackson collapsed on stage while rehearsing for an HBO concert special in New York. His doctor said Michael was suffering from a viral infection. Lisa Marie flew to his side in the hospital, where he stayed for six days. Everybody flew to the hospital, and um, it was very confusing what was wrong, because every day there was a different report and I couldn't tell what was happening. Dehydration, low blood pressure, um, exhaustion, a virus. So I couldn't really get a straight answer as to what was happening with him and I think we were all a little bit in the dark and I, um, at that point I think I really, I got uh, from various uh, indications I, I believed that that was going on then. You thought that there was some the drug use? Yes. Yeah. And you know, there were times when I would pick him up from a certain doctor's office and he would not be coherent. Mm -hmm. And there was some behavior now looking back at it. And I knew that that was, you know, because of injections, because they were painful and he would need certain things because he, he needed to. So that he would need things for what? We, we're the... Injections or whatever various dermatological, you know. Is this for his skin disease? <clears throat> skin and mm -hmm. various uh, 
things he needed. Was it the kind of marriage where a lot of things went unsaid or unspoken, or did you feel a sense of intimacy and connection that you could ask him anything? I am, I honestly can tell you that it was in, it was every sense a normal marriage and everything was spoken and, you know, in the middle of the night, if he needed to wake up and tell me and, and bounce something off me and wake me up and want to, you know, talk or if there was trouble or, I mean, was it, he having was trouble great. sleeping then? Yes. He was like a little gnome. I used to talk, tell him he was like a gnome running around the room mm -hmm. because it was hard for me to sleep. A lot of times I couldn't sleep either if he wasn't sleeping. So he would be, I just hear him piddling and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it was a bit endearing. Mm -hmm. But then, and I, I didn't mind it, but um, he, he did have a, a hard time sleeping, yes. Did you feel like you were, in many ways, a nurturer, caretaker for him? Very much. That role, and I loved taking care of him. It was my, it was the highest point of my life, one of the very highest points of my life, was when things were going really well and he and I were united together and he and I had an understanding about some of the people and things that could go on around him mm -hmm. um, and he was with me on those things and we were, we were a unit and I could take care of him and in spite of what some people speculated while I was with him that I wanted a career or that I was trying to do something, it was absolute BS. I've yeah. never been comfortable being front and center honestly don't like attention on me loved being next to him and taking care of him i was on such a high doing that that i don't you know th that it was it was a very profound time in my life so mm -hmm. i it wasn't anything it was real as far as that goes i heard you said to the producers that being with him was some of the highest highs for you mm -hmm. as you just described and also the lowest lows yes. what was the lowest low the lowest was, you know, again, when I talk about him, I don't, I now in retrospect want to make very clear that I understand him now more than I ever did. Mm -hmm. So when I speak about him, I can speak about him with uh, understanding and, and, it, and it's, all, it's all good now. Uh, it, for some reason, I don't know what happens when someone passes away and it, this is what's come of it, but I've come to have all this love again. Mm -hmm. and understanding for him and I don't know why it had to take all that to have this happen it mm -hmm. that upsets me a bit but the love were you angry with him before I was angry you were angry with him when you left the marriage I was very angry mm -hmm. I was so angry because I felt that we had and then at some point he 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 pushed me out why did the marriage end um, there was a very profound point in the marriage when he had to make a decision was it the drugs and the and the sort of vampires or me and he pushed me away vampires meaning uh, people that are sort of spiders vampires um, sick of it, sucking his blood mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you saw that all around him oh god yes yeah. yes and it was and, and, you know, many people talk about that in stories written about him he seemed to be drawn to people who would take advantage of him what was that the one thing that correlates with with Michael and with my father on this subject is that they had the luxury of creating whatever reality around them they wanted to create. They could have the kinds of people who were going to go with their program or not go with their program. And if they weren't, then they could be disposed of. Mm -hmm. It's didn't... the reality of being a god in your own world. Right. Yeah. And this is something that I've ex had way with too your much father? experience with yeah. mm -hmm. on both sides where I've seen what can go on and that and that is um, um my way or the highway right michael wasn't a bad person because that's how he functioned he didn't know any better it wasn't that you know i took it very personally though i, I felt i was disposable you know and, and it was the same with my father sometimes i sit and i think there have been times when i've been angry at the people around him why didn't you stop him why didn't you say something well because if you did you were out mm. it's very simple mm -hmm. And he didn't so he wasn't the kind either. of person, he wasn't, nor your father was, the kind of person who wanted people around him telling them the truth. He wanted to be told what he wanted to hear. When it's this unusual reality and an ivory tower and this godlike life mixed with an addiction, that's when you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. A lot of trouble. 
August 16, 1977, nine-year-old Lisa Marie was home at Graceland when her father Elvis suddenly collapsed in his bathroom and died. There was a lethal mix of 14 prescription drugs in his system. Are you struck between the parallel in your father's life and Michael Jackson's life? Your father and your former husband? Yes. It, um, it really blows me away, to be honest with you. I still try to figure out why, what is it that I had to go through it twice, <laughs> where these two incredible people, and I speak, you know, with the utmost respect and love, because uh, I had that for both. Your father who, and Michael. Yes, who had the same fate. Um, what is it about me? Why did I have to just, I went through it once, that was painful, and I went through it again, and I don't quite understand it, you know? When we were hiking this summer, Lisa shared something with me that I think you all will find uh, interesting. This is a home in Los Angeles where Michael Jackson died. Across the street, just a stone's throw away, was Elvis Presley's California home, where Lisa Marie spent a lot of time growing up. What about the irony of that? Just across the street. It's... My mother, when I came home after being in England for so long, she, I, I wanted to drive by and see where it was. And I lived there up until after he died. She sold it. So, and I had several birthdays there. And um, I said, well, you, she said, it's right across the street. I said, oh, please, it's not right across the street. You're being, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. shoot her off. And I drove. And it literally, I was completely, you know, I don't even know how to describe that, how that felt. Mm. Because I, and I don't even know if he knew, that was just another thing where, it, these things keep happening and I still, in the universe, and I'm, okay, then what is it that I, I, I'm trying to learn here, what is it that I'm, I need to know? I thought it was interesting when you wrote the blog the day after Michael Jackson's death, you titled the blog, He Knew. Mm. What did he know? When I was watching the footage of the ambulance backing out of the driveway and I went back to this conversation that I had with him at Neverland in the library we were sitting by the fire and um he was telling me that he was afraid that he was going to end up like my father you know he was always asking me about when he died and how it happened and when it happened and where and um Michael was always asking you about your father yes mm -hmm. and he said I feel like I'm going to end up the same way and did you say why? Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? And I, I don't understand. Down to the play-by-play-by-play -by -play -by -play incident was identical. First of all, you were much younger then. But as you look back at your marriage to him and who you were in that marriage, do you think there was a big part of you that didn't want to see the truth? The truth in, in what, in the what way? The truth about the drugs. I was so naive then, but I know it's not easy to believe that now, but... Well, it is easy to believe we can understand the state of mind you were in. Um, so first of all, you growing up as Elvis Presley's daughter uh, and being in your own right who you are, you wouldn't be excited about being married to Michael Jackson. It's not like some fan who ended up married to Michael Jackson, so because you're used to the fame life. So you fell in love with him because of? For him, because he was an incredible, incredibly dynamic person. If you were in his vicinity and he wanted to give and he gave and he showed you who he was if yeah. he was willing to yeah. do that yeah. in any way yeah. man i have never felt so high in my life yeah. uh -huh. i have never felt so high in my life as that and i am not lying when i say that he had something so intoxicating mm -hmm. about him and when he was on and when he was ready to share with you or give mm -hmm. it to you and be himself and allow you to come in i don't know if i've ever been that intoxicated by anything. Mm -hmm. I can I can I can hear what you're saying because when I first interviewed first met him before the interview in 1992 uh it's like he shined his light upon you. He yeah. like 
let, when he opens that opens himself up and lets that light through you just want to be in that yes you want to be in that you want to be around that and you know we were all at neverland and eating the candy and having a great time and i left thinking gosh i wish i could be his friend yeah you know? it was like a drug he was like a drug for me i felt like i just always wanted to be around him i always wanted to be part of i just i felt so high i've never felt like that around another human being except for one mm. you know which is my father it's so interesting because you just said it. You were nine years old when your father died. Never felt that feeling before. So in many ways, being with Michael brought back that feeling of that light falling on you, that being, yes. you know, all of that energy coming your way. Yes. Did you feel loved by Michael in the beginning? Very much so. Mm -hmm. I don't think I realized it at the time how much because I know that that was very unusual for him. I know he'd had a few dates in his life, but there, mm -hmm. there was nothing uh, profound for him in that, in that area. And, and he, he, he fell in love with me, and I, and I fell in love with him, and it was very real. How did he ask you to marry him? Um, we were in the library in front of the fire, and he, he pulled this giant 10-carat diamond out of his pocket and um, put it on my finger. Mm -hmm. I think he got on his knees as, as well and proposed. Mm -hmm. And at the time he proposed, did you think that would, it would be forever? I did. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I did. And when I was younger, I can honestly say that um, you can think like that and, and believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, from the outside, it just seems so that, you know, two extraordinarily famous people together, everywhere you went, seemed somewhat like a circus. It was. It's true. But, mm -hmm. you know, that didn't happen that often we were together a lot and there was no cameras and uh, i think a lot of that was because the 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 promo for history started to come and then we had to appear here and do this mm -hmm. and do that and that was all very manipulated which which i understand comes across as very manipulated mm -hmm. period did you ever feel manipulated in the relationship sometimes but he knew i didn't love that and mm -hmm. he was okay he got it i mean he he would he needed he needed to do his thing i would be there uncomfortably like the MTV mm -hmm. thing and I, his hand was blue after we got off that stage I know he showed me and it was uh, you know completely blue I squeezed it so hard <laughs> I did not want to do that you know it was just it's not in my nature to do that sort of thing so but I understood it as his wife I had you know I needed to do some things like that Lisa Marie and Michael Jackson had been married for a year when he released the intimate music video for You Are Not Alone. So was there a lot of pressure for you to have a baby? Yes. Um, there was quite a bit. I mean, he was... From the time you got married? Mm-hmm. Th there was, not and I did want to. I just kept... I just wanted to make sure... I, I, was, I was looking into the future, and I was thinking... I don't ever want to get into a, a, a custody battle with him. I don't want to do this. I don't mm -hmm. want to go head to head with him. So I need to make sure that everything around is good. I know I've had, I had children. I knew mm -hmm. bringing children into certain circumstances, you have to make sure everything's safe and secured mm -hmm. and okay. And I wanted to make sure that he and I were really, really united because we were going to be up against so much. I can't remember the exact month you all divorced, but you divorced and several months later I know by October it was announced that Debbie Rowe was pregnant mm -hmm. how did you feel about that well I knew it was a bit of a retaliatory act on his part mm -hmm. because um, I didn't you know have have a baby and um, and I know that she was there the whole time telling him she would do it so you knew that he would tell me. He would come tell me. If you're not going to do it, Debbie said she'll do it. And I was like, what is that? Hi. Uh, not going to entice me. Um, so we would get into it, you know, arguments because that really wasn't how to handle it. But that's how he knew how to handle it. I don't want to say, you know, he, he, like I said, he would be like, well, if you're not going to, this person will. Are you going to do it or not? Mm -hmm. And That's what you mean by disposable. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, that's exactly what I mean. Oh, I get it. Well, yeah. there are not many men who, who would say, you either have a baby for me or I got somebody standing in the wings. And right, and it's, will. it sounds, you know, hindsight 2020. I understand him so well now. Um, but at that time, I hurt. didn't. I was hurt. I was hurt, and, you know, I did things that hurt him, you know, and I did stupid things, too. And like? Like, I was very torn because I broke up my family. Uh, I, I left my husband 
for Michael. And I was having a hard time trying to process that. Lisa Marie was 20 years old when she married her first husband, musician Danny Keough. Together, they had two children, Riley and Ben. After more than five years together, Lisa Marie divorced Danny. 20 days later, she was married again to Michael Jackson. While I was with Michael, I was still trying to process what I had done. Mm -hmm. I never could feel good about it. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like, how could I have done that to somebody? And I had these two little ones. And uh, Danny was still very much part of my life. Michael didn't quite know what to do with that mm -hmm. sometimes. And that made him uncomfortable, and I understood that. Michael would wonder, why are you in Hawaii with Danny? I would take a vacation, and Danny would go. Mm -hmm. And Michael would get upset, and where are you? And then he would disappear for a couple weeks, and I couldn't find him. Or, you know, things would make him uncomfortable. And when I would do things that would make Michael uncomfortable, if he got uncomfortable or felt vulnerable, he would ice you out as a mechanism. He'd push you away and ice you. It was like a shark sometimes in that way. You could just... That's it. You know, mm -hmm. you've done him wrong or whatever, so you were out. And I did some, we had moments like that. And But I have to say in retrospect that he honestly tried so hard and went through so much with me. And I know now when I look back at it, he's never done that with any other female or anyone as much as we went through. And when we hit rough waters and we would, and we would argue, three-day arguments, sometimes taking a break to eat and sleep. Wow. You know, I'd have to say that I really admire that he really gave it a good shot, you know? I didn't appreciate it then, and I wish I did. Um, I think I think so, sadly. Is that the first time you recognized or believed that he truly loved you after he died? Um, I think yes. Sweeping answer would be yes. When we were together, we were really in love, and then we had the rough patches, and then I had to make a decision to walk because I saw that the drugs and the doctors were coming in, and they scared me and put me right back into what I went through with my father, so I that ended it. And then we, again, were going to get back together. For We still spent four more years after we divorced really? getting back together and breaking up and talking about getting back together and breaking up. and. And at some point, I had to push it away because it was just not, it just, I wasn't moving forward in, with myself. So you still loved him even when you left him? He, very much. I left him to put my, to sort of stomp my foot into the ground and go, I, I was trying to take a stand and say, come with me, don't do this. Mm -hmm. And I was a stupid move because he didn't. And yeah. he was just, you know, he's a stubborn I'm stubborn, he's stubborn, the two of us, it was like, you know. Don't make a dare you're not willing to follow through on. Right. So I, I made a stupid move. And, and, and I, I, I actually, afterwards, you know, he and I were still, you know, I, I, I was flying all over the world still with him uh, for years to follow. When was the last time you spoke to him? Uh, coherently good conversation mm -hmm. was in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, it was... A and I was so removed from him, and he could feel it, and he could hear it. And I think that's one of the things that killed me in the end, too, was that I was very um, distanced, and he was checking to get a read. You know, he was trying to throw a line out to see if I would bite. Emotionally, and I wouldn't. I was pretty shut off at that point. And I don't even know how I managed to be like that, but I was. And he was asking me, he wanted to tell me that he, uh, that I was right about a lot of the people around him, and that it had panned out to be exactly what he and I had talked about years ago and he asked if I still loved him and we went into a whole thing about that and I told him I was indifferent and he didn't like that word and he cried and he was just trying to find out where I was at and how I could become so detached and then the final part of the conversation was him uh, telling me that he felt that um, that someone was going to try and kill him to get a hold of his catalog and his his estate and I really didn't know what to do with that. So he actually gave you names? He did, and mm -hmm. I, I would like not to say them, but he, he expressed to me uh, his concern over his... Uh, you know, I asked you this, the, and I have to ask it again, uh, even though it's an uncomfortable subject, but when you were on the show the first time, I think I asked you this, whether you had ever seen any 
inappropriate behavior between Michael Jackson and young children. Mm -hmm. Are you asking me again? I'm asking you again. The answer is absolutely uh, not in any way. Mm -hmm. I did not see anything like that. So by 2005, I think, when he was on trial for the second charge, right. your feelings at that time were what? Did he ever talk to you about it? Did he he was calling me about it, and I said, please keep your head together, please. If this goes to trial, please hold it together. And he said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And I said, he said, you mean drugs? I said, yes, because all I saw... You know, there was a few year period there where he was random things were coming out, whether it was a Martin Bashir interview or mm -hmm. various interviews. And in those interviews, I saw him intoxicated. I didn't see Michael that I knew in that Martin Bashir interview. I saw, I, he was high as a kite from what I saw and really? from what I knew. Really? He was either too speedy or he was sedated. It wasn't the Michael that I knew. The shocking things, he said some pretty shocking things in that Martin Bashir interview, particularly about how he felt it was okay to sleep with young children. I think he said that stuff sometimes to be defiant because he got so angry at, 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 at having been accused. I think that sometimes he was such a little stubborn rebel sometimes and he was like a child and he would just say what he felt everyone didn't want him to say. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like he, he was had a straight head mm -hmm. uh, during those things. And I think that they were edited in a very, very manipulative, nasty uh, way. So you never saw anything, and to this day, you don't believe that any of those charges were true? No, I mean, I, can, I honestly cannot say, the only people that are ever going to be able to honestly say the truth are him and whoever was in the room at the time of whatever allegedly took place. I was mm -hmm. never in that room. It would be unfair for me to, I can tell you, I never saw anything like that. Mm -hmm. Have you now made peace with his death? I know you watched the funeral that we all saw on television, and I know that you went to the private funeral ceremony. What was that like, standing in the room with his casket? Mm, that was um, really another six months of more to recover from, I think. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was the last one standing with him. Um, and that was, you What know, do you mean, last one standing? Well, most people had left, and I went back in, and I was alone with him. And the, standing over him, you know, I, I didn't want to leave him. So. As you stood over his casket, uh, I know it's, you know, it's, it's there's probably nothing more, um, you know, personal or private uh, than those those moments as you stood over that casket were you able to make peace mm. no I don't think I could make peace then I think that I more I wanted to apologize I more was like I felt like I wanted to apologize for not being around you know do you think you could have saved him that's such a hard question. Um, naively, I want to say, I know that it's naive to think that I could have, but I wanted to. Could I have? Had I made a call? Had I stopped being so tur shut off from him? Had I just said, how are you? Can I try to make a phone call? You know, I really did regret that I didn't. Mm -hmm. Do you think that family and friends let him down? Do you think that somebody could have done something? I think that they tried. And I, and I, and, and sadly, um, like I said, if, if he didn't want you around, if you were going to make him confront something he didn't want to confront, he could make it go away, including his own family. Mm -hmm. and they got on the opposite side of that. I think that was a train headed in a certain direction that I don't know if anyone could have stopped. And, I, and I've had to really get my head around that in order to stop the the pain for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how is this for your current husband, who seems like a really loving, generous, supportive man, 
How is it for him with all this Michael stuff coming up? He's so happy I'll be done with this interview. <laughs> He's just like, I want you to just exercise this and get it out because I've been... You know, he's had to hear it for so long. He's Never good for the current husband to have to hear about the ex-husband a lot. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. No, and I understand that. But he also understands. He's the most understanding person I've ever met in my life. And I, I'm, I've never, you know, I, I thank God because he's really allowed me to go through whatever I need to go through with this, mm -hmm. which I know would be highly, highly unusual. And it's a lot to ask for mm -hmm. of him. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel good about it, but it's something that came down, uh, came down on me that I've had to I've had to deal with, and I've been doing it. Because all these Michael feelings were repressed and buried when you started dating Michael Lott.